So the first first piece of equipment that we're going to look at is routers. And the thing that you want to really walk away with routers is regardless of their size, their cost, their complexity, all routers are just basically computers. That is not true of a switch. That's not true of many other devices. But of a router, they are just like a computer. They're going to have an operating system. Linux is very popular, but Cisco has their own unique proprietary <coughs> iOS. And they call it the iOS. It's a, I believe it's a Berkeley version of Unix. Juniper uses their, uh, their own uh, operating system. So it's going to have an operating system. Typically, it's either going to be a Unix variant or a Linux variant is the most popular operating systems. It's going to have a CPU. It's going to have RAM. It's going to have ROM. Now the only unique feature of routers is they, they talk a lot about NVRAM. So when we talk about NVRAM, think of that as their hard drive. This is what they usually talk about. They'll, they'll say NVRAM a lot, and when we, whenever we're saying NVRAM, that is going to be really the router's hard drive. The diagram, when you look at a diagram with a router in it, that is the symbol. Now there's two players that determine network device symbols. That's Visio, Microsoft's Visio. Visio is a template that designs logical diagram. So Microsoft and Cisco really rule the symbol world. I mean, how do we, what symbol represents a router? Uh, so when you see a network diagram and you see that symbol, you know it's a router. That is something you must start getting comfortable. We, all, we also call it a default gateway. <clears throat> so here's a very complex network diagram, and we're expected as techs to understand the symbols of firewalls. This is a router, a 2500 router, Cisco router. This is a 7000 Cisco series router. And we're to understand how it works, how it functions. Routers are always between subnets. So Anytime you have a subnet here, you see a 28.59, 14.25, you see a different subnet over here, you must place a router between different subnets. Always recognize the symbols. This is something you need to start really picking up and understanding. When I see that symbol, that's a router. Anytime you have a subnet, you must bring a router. At home, SOHO routers are the most common use that we find in the home. But as we leave the home, we start getting into serious small business. You're gonna see uh, routers like this. This is Cisco. HP sells them, Trendnet sells them. Many, many companies sell the branch. Dell has a whole line of small business routers for branch sites. So you'll see that change. Then you get into WANs, serious, serious routers, very, very large organizations. Uh, these are probably half a million dollars a pop easily. A lot of companies sell that. Then we get into service providers, people like CenturyLink, Bright House, AT&T, Verizon. This is the kind of router they buy. These are probably a million dollars uh, for one of these routers and they are incredibly powerful. So routers are often called default gateways. This is an interesting thing. For whatever reason, the world of TCP IP always, always, always had a tendency to call these gateways. So when you use the language of TCP IP, it was always the gateway, yet everybody else called it routers. So just understand when we talk about routers, the same word is applied to default gateway. So anytime you say default gateway, you're talking the router. Here's an example of, T uh, I did an IP config of my PC at work, and you can see there's an area where you have the default gateway and you have an IP address. So even here in our IP config, instead of saying router, why not? We have to use the word default gateway. So this is a real, because the language of IP, the language of TCP IP, 
that has always been the, the, the word that is used to the router. So the default gateway and the router's IP. Now, this is very important. All printers, all printers, all servers need to know the router's IP address. If you have a local area network and it, they want to leave the local area network, they must have the router IP. What are the two pieces of information we must have in order to work on a LAN only? What two pieces of IP information that we have to have in order to work on a LAN? If we want to leave the LAN and go to another subnet, we must have a gateway. But just to work on a LAN, what two IP bits of information must The subnet mask and the IP address. So just local area network, you need the subnet mask and the IP address. If you want to leave that subnet and go somewhere else, you must have a default gateway. This is the inside of a typical router. Uh, let me just kind of show you around. This area here, let me, uh, man, I like my little laser print pointer here. This area here is basically what we call interfaces. So let's say you're going to connect a DSL connection. This card would be designated just to handle DSL and convert it into Ethernet or whatever uh, protocol you're going to do. So each of these cards in the front, and you can see it's got a big bay here, so you could have a fiber optics connector and this card would handle that fiber optics. The one thing about routers it's about interfaces because routers connect to many kinds, T1, T3s, frame relay, uh, ASDL, DSL, all kinds of telecom uh, connections can come into your router. So a lot of real estate in a router is given to handling the different kinds. Is it a T1? I have to have a card for a T1. Is it a DSL? I have to have a card for a DSL. So a lot of the cost and a lot of the real estate of the inside of a router is designated for the interface for whatever you're going to put in. And all of these are swappable. So you can put in an Ethernet interface, a DSL interface, a frame relay, a fiber optic, whatever you want. They're very, very flexible. Any kind of telecom connection you can think of, you can put a card in here that will work with it. The rest of the inside of your of your router is basically your CPUs, your RAM, your NVRAM, your logic. Notice it's got a lot of DIMM sockets and of course you want to put memory in a Cisco router. Don't think for one minute you can go to Best Buy. Of course not. You have to buy Cisco proprietary <coughs> DIMMs. You can't buy any old DIMMs. These run about, this is a branch office router, a 2500, 2600. They run about $2,300 plus the warranty and the support. So you can pay another $300 a year for support. So they're very expensive. I've seen branch offices where a business is buying one of these when they could have easily gotten something much less expensive and it would have done them fine. So make sure you know what you're doing uh, before you let a salesperson sell something. These routers are often found in T-Mobile, Verizon, AT&T, CenturyLink, Sprint. They use the kind, these kind of routers. These are serious, serious routers. They are first class. They're amazing. They just I mean, just going near them is... <clears throat> now listen very carefully. I'm going to talk about this. For the exam, you need to know routers work at what layer? They work at layer 3, but technically routers work at layer 1, layer 2, and layer 3. But the answers to the questions when we talk about routers is they are layer three. They are slower and more expensive because of the decisions and routing that has to be done. Let me give you an example. Bright House, if you bring 100 megabits per second Bright House connection, your home router has to inspect and route between 1,500 packets per second and 100,000 packets per second. This takes a tremendous amount of computational power. If you go to Cisco's site, and I've got a link here, and you can go get, I'll show you where all of this, the PowerPoint, the study guide, and all this is at. If you go to that link, it actually takes you to a chart and shows you how, for every bits per second that you have connected uh, to your home, it shows you how many packets per second your router must 
route and make determination on. It is not easy. So here's, if you go to Bright House, it costs you $92 a month to get 100 megabits, but you better make sure your router can handle over 100,000 packets per second, because that's what it's going to have to do. So a lot of times people think, I'm going to buy a faster bandwidth connection via Bright House, and I have a junky little router sitting in there, and that's going to handle it. You if you use, all. right, if you use their router, which I don't, uh, I just say bring me a network connection. Uh, if you use their router, they have to upgrade that router. Yeah, they have to. So let's take a look. Oops. This is the kind of action that takes place inside your router. If you're thinking your router is simple, look over here. We got incoming packets. You have a packet buffer. You have logic that has to be that has to open the packet. It has to look at the packet. It has to look at the destination IP. It has to go through a series of firewalls, NAT, then it goes out of, the, out of the control plane of the router, and then out the interface. All of this takes time. A router has to do pretty intensive packet inspection. Pretty intensive packet inspection. And because of that, it's time consuming and complex. Don't think that routers are simple. They're not. They're very complex. When you take a ISP router like this one, each of these connections is a gigabit. Some of them are 10 gigabit. So every one of these connections you see on these bus bars, you see these uh, large uh, slide-in racks that go in, each connection is probably a gig or 10 gig. This is typically what you'll see in Tampa and Miami in the uh, internet connection point. If you have a gigabit connection, that router has to route between 1 million packets per second and 10 million packets per second. It has to open them up, inspect them, find the destination IP, look at the rules that are set up in the router, make a, look at the routing table, and send that off in the right direction. That's why they're going to pay a million dollars for one of them, just for the computational power to do it. It's quite amazing. So in reality, the answer to the question, what layer does the router work at? It works at layer three or the network layer, but in reality, it really works at all three. Let's take a look. So notice that IP6 and IP4 are at the network layer. Let's take a look at an animation here. Let's see if I can get this to go. Playing with all kinds of cool toys. So here you can actually see the packet coming down the stack and the movie is not that great. But what I do, I was hoping for better quality than that. All right, I want you to look right here. Let me get my laser pointer. My video did not turn out loud. This is the router right here. This is the router. Notice that it's basically going to work at layer what? Three. Layer 3. But it does have a data link layer, and it does have a physical layer. And to leave the router, of course, you're going to have a data link layer and a physical layer. So routers, in the reality, have all three layers. In the questions that they're going to ask you in CompTIA, it's going to be layer three.